it is great to have you here. Uh, the, when I was at that Never Is Now conference, I was just um, really won over by both Yair's um, balanced view, his, uh, his choice of words, his intelligent thinking, and also the way he can disarm an audience and anybody who's coming after him. And so uh, Shoshana mentioned this uh, task force and study that ADL did last year about attacks on journalists, and specifically hate and anti-Semitism <coughs> directed at journalists. Let me just throw a few numbers out at you. Um, we, we, did the, we studied pre predominantly within social media, we focused on Twitter. And we looked at 2.6, we, we did a massive search of key terms that often come up in anti-Semitic tweets. That, that got us down to about 2.6 million tweets, which probably reached 10, million, 10 billion people. Um, and we then started looking at that 2.6 million. And here's what we found. About two thirds of them came from 1,600 Twitter accounts. So there are a core of people pushing these negative messages out towards journalists. Next, the next stat I want to say is that um, there were probably in that 2.6 million, there were approximately 20,000 directed at Jewish journalists. And those 20,000 were directed at 800 Jewish journalists. And then we looked at the top 10. 83% of, of the, those 20,000 tweets were directed at 10 individuals. And the first, the, the one who received the most was a, is a conservative writer named Ben Shapiro. And we've got number two right here. Uh, Yair Rosenberg, who, um, and I'm going to steal his joke, I don't think his parents taught him to come in second, but I think in this particular situation that was fine. You, didn't want, you don't want to be first on that list. But he really took a, a real, um, it, you know, it takes a lot of strength to continue doing what he does and to tell the truth and call it as he see it, sees it, and um, I'm very proud to have him here. And so I thought I would start off our questioning today by asking you, Yair, the trolling that happens, the, the threats that you receive, how does it and how does it affect your ability to do your job? Well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to Steve and to the ADL for having me, and thank you all of you for coming. Um, I know if it was me and I wasn't you know, asked to speak here, I would not venture outside my house in this weather. <laughs> so I very much appreciate all of you coming. Um, so the question was, um, how does trolling, sort of harassment that journalists like myself face uh, affect our ability to do our jobs. And that probably depends on the journalist. Um, someone like me, who has been doing this for many years and reported about many, like my, I always used to joke, uh, if the political scene in America gets too toxic, I can always fall back on my usual beats of anti-Semitism in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I'm sort of used to reporting on you know, darker scenarios and places where things don't always work out and sometimes the discourse can be very polarizing. So I was sort of prepared during the 2016 campaign to receive some of this stuff and the stuff that went towards a lot of journalists. Uh, other journalists aren't used to that. They cover city hall or they cover national politics and this was their first experience of getting extraordinarily hateful content directed at them. Um, and it was more difficult and it was an adjustment period. Some friends I know who are fantastic journalists uh, tried to pull back from social media. They kept doing their jobs and writing their stories, uh, but they receded from the social media space because they didn't want to deal with this sort of stuff and this sort of negativity, which is sort of what these sorts of trolls and people want. Uh, but at the same time, if that's what you do because it's unhealthy for your life, if this stuff is going on, right, no one should question that. Um, so I've been fortunate that uh, that's not how it affects me, and I sort of had built up an immune system to that point. Thanks. Can you, can you tell us, maybe give a couple examples of <clears throat> your approach and how you formulate your response when these things come at you? Yeah, so I had been getting, because my name is Yair Rosenberg, and I write about very Jewish issues for a Jewish publication, Tablet Magazine. Uh, I've been getting this stuff for many years, long before the 2016 election. And <clears throat> the best instinct and the first impulse of many people is to sort of just ignore this stuff or block the users who send it to you. Um, and that's normally what I do 90, 95% of the time. Uh, but as someone who covers anti-Semitism and finds that one of the big roadblocks to raising awareness about anti-Semitism is the fact that lots of good, well-meaning people are simply unaware that it's a real thing. 
that it still exists and that it's out there and that it affects real people's lives. Uh, I started to realize that this is actually something of a teaching moment because I have thousands of followers on social media, wonderful people, Jewish, not Jewish, um, all sorts of political views. Um, and they value what I have to say in my experience. And so if I start sharing, this is the sort of thing that I get hit with and showing them you know, what I'm seeing, then perhaps that could sort of raise some awareness about the issue. Uh, but then the challenge becomes, how do you do that without depressing everyone who's reading you? Because uh, anti-Semitism and hatred uh, don't make really for very shareable content. So I started to think, how do you get people to like, share anti-Semitism on social media? This is a very weird idea. Um, but what I stumbled upon was uh, humor. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Once about once every month, uh, I'll get somebody, usually someone from the far right, not always, who will you know, tweet at me, why won't you Jews just admit you control 92% you know, of the media? Um, and the non-Jews are figuring it out. And you're not long for this, you know, this, the gig is up. And, uh, you know, you could just ignore that. Um, but what I've started to do whenever I get hit with this, and there's a, it's a very persistent accusation, Jews control the media. They have these little infographics with pictures of journalists, and they put Stars of David on them, whether they're Jewish or not. Um, and these things circulate around the Internet. And so I will like, excerpt this tweet, and I'll say, you know, this is preposterous. Um, we don't control 92% of the media. I looked at the figures at the last meeting, and we control 96. <laughs> I don't know where you're getting your numbers from, but at least you should get your facts straight. And so what the advantage of this is that it's actually funny. You all just laugh. And someone on Twitter says, oh, that was funny, and they retweet it. And then lots of people retweeted it because they thought it was a funny joke. Right, which is something they wouldn't do if I just said, oh my god, did you see this racist thing? Which would have been retweeted by people who already knew this was a problem and cared about this, but probably nobody else. But people retweet something because it's funny, because it made them laugh, and then they share it, and they all become informal educators about anti-Semitism. Uh, so that, to me, is one of the ways I try to take the sort of hatred that gets thrown at me um, and the conspiracy theories that get thrown at Jews in general um, and bring them to a wider world in a safer way and in a way that educates. So are there... Are there some times where humor doesn't work, where that is not, you can't go to that place for, because based on the content or the person who's coming after you? Yeah, and the sort of things that I deal with, so I can describe to you stuff that I am able to turn around, so to speak. Uh, but there are certain types of hatred, especially not always directed at Jews, but say you're a woman. A lot of female journalists get a lot of misogynistic uh, threats, rape threats on Twitter. Um, and that sort of thing cannot be turned into a joke. And the most you can do with that is report it. And Twitter has gotten a lot better at dealing with this stuff and knocking off users who do this sort of thing. Um, if you went back you know, a year ago, they were much slower. But they've put a lot more people on the subject, and they have a lot better tools for dealing with it. And in, if, you know, in certain cases, you report something like that to law enforcement if it becomes persistent. Uh, so it's important that people should realize that the sort of thing that I do is for a particular type of content, a particular type of experience. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can be done for everything, and you shouldn't minimize the issue. So one little sidebar here um, to share a little bit about the ADL role with respect to anti-Semitism and threats on social media. Um, probably about 10 or 15 years ago, ADL started to see the prolif proliferation of hate on the internet, on message boards, if you remember those, um, and, and in social media. And we went out to California, and we sat down with the leaders then of all the big internet companies. Yahoo, Google, had Google started then? I can't, all, all, the, big, all the big guys. Um, and we created a task force that met almost in secret, because it's very interesting when you're one of these social media companies. You don't want hate to spread, but they're when you run one of those companies, but you also don't want to be seen as censoring speech. A, because it's not necessarily good for business, because if you censor speech, people might stop using your platform. And B, because they see themselves as serving a role of the town or public square. So the social media companies are caught in this position where they are not the government, and they actually can regulate everything that's said on those sites. However, they have strong incentives to not do so. So we work with them to create what became their terms of service. And basically, you know those words that you click on whenever you sign up for something and you don't read them? Embedded in there is a release that gives, that describes what types of 
language and behavior is not acceptable on the platform. And that is how people, places like Twitter, can then say that their users have violated those terms and can take it down. So they've come to a nice place. It's gotten a lot better. Twitter was slower than most to get with the program, but it's, they're, we're ma they're making a lot of strides. Um, so back to Yair. Um, have you ever been concerned for your own personal safety? No. Let's see if this is, there we go. So I personally am not particularly worried. Um, I've been doing this for years, and the stuff that has happened online to me has stayed online. Um, that's not always the case. It depends who you're dealing with. Um, I generally think that the issue is less uh, worrisome in, say, the United States, where the sort of stuff you'll see and the abuse you'll find on social media comes from people who hide behind anon anonymous avatars and usernames. They don't put their name to the things that they say. Um, and I've actually interviewed some of these people who actually harassed me. And I said, why don't you put your name on it? And they said, I'm not stupid. I know that if people knew in my you know, actual real life hometown the sorts of things that I'm saying here, that my livelihood, my job, and you know, my general place in the community would be jeopardized. And so as long as people feel that if they actually put their name to these things and they actually connect their real life selves to these sentiments um, would ha adversely affect uh, their lives, I'm not too worried about them. Um, but if you go to, say, places like Europe um, and, say, like, you know, the United Kingdom right now, there has been a serious problem of abuse uh, towards Jews um, and others, uh, particularly coming from the far left. Um, and usually this involves people who are, like, spouting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about Jews in the media, Jews in the economy, Jews being behind ISIS, a lot of weird stuff. But the thing is, there are people who are doing it who are active in the Labor Party, in politics, and posting it on their Facebook page under their own name. And I've written some of this up in my own journalism. And that, to me, is far more worrisome, because the fact that you say this under your own name and say it in a public forum while in a public position you know, suggests that there's something wrong in the culture and something scary in the culture where it's acceptable in some quarters to say these sorts of things out loud. And so that's where you start to worry more. Uh, and if we get to that point in the United States, that's where I would start to worry. Um, but right now, these people are still um, largely afraid to put their name to these things. Um, and that, I think, says something good about the climate. And part of what I do when I say mock this sort of anti-Semitism and make fun of it is to try to reinforce those boundaries on social media and in the discourse and saying, if you do this, we'll make fun of you. And everyone will laugh at you and think that you're ridiculous. So you probably should stay in your closet behind your anonymous cartoon avatar because everyone knows that what you're saying is not acceptable and you're not welcome here with those views. So in a more general sense, can you give us your thoughts on how social media has changed the role of the journalist and journalism? So this is actually a very interesting question. Um, and it's much bigger than Jewish journalists or anti-Semitism or harassment. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room has seen the documentary called The War Room. Anyone familiar with that? So it was this documentary that came out in the 90s. It was a behind-the-scenes look at Bill Clinton's winning presidential campaign against George H.W. Bush. It's what made you know, George Stephanopoulos and James Carville into like celebrity political aides before we didn't have that position. But this documentary followed them around like superheroes and like behind the scenes and all of that, and they made them figures. Um, and it shows how a campaign used to work and how the news cycle used to work. And there's this fascinating you know, subplot in the documentary when the campaign gets word from an ally of the campaign. Here's a clip that we found that aired a couple weeks ago on South American television. It appears that some printers in Argentina, I think it was, are printing signs um, for Bush quail. And so this looks really bad for the Bush campaign. It looks like they're spending campaign dollars outside America, which could be illegal, and is certainly not in keeping with their message of spending in America and building American jobs, paying for cheap labor to build their campaign in South America. So they're all very giddy with this. They get the clip, and they send the clip to a bunch of news outlets. And they're all waiting on tender hooks you know, to see the stories hit the media. And they're waiting, and they're waiting, and the story doesn't seem to come out. And finally, they get called back by the journalists. And the journalists they sent it to say, well, we looked into it. We asked the Bush Quail campaign, what's up with this? And they said, oh, those signs, they're being printed. We looked into it. Those are being printed by an ally of our campaign. They're not members of our campaign. It's not our campaign's money. It's really just a freelance operation of somebody who likes our candidacy. Um, and of course, we don't spend any of our money in South America. And this is you know, just a freelance operation by somebody else. And the journalists checked that out. And it turned out it was true. So literally, this had nothing to do with the Bush Quail campaign. And they didn't do it. And so they said, we're not going to run the story. And you see how disappointed the uh, 
Clinton campaign is that this story didn't happen, and we never have known it happened if not for this documentary that came out long after. Now, imagine how that story plays out in today's environment. Right? There's no way that story doesn't come out. What happens? First of all, it doesn't take two weeks for somebody to discover this clip on South American television. It will be immediately tweeted by somebody without any context, and then it will get retweeted thousands of times. And then bloggers will start writing it up. And then all the news agencies and journalists, their editors will say, well, this is all over the internet. We have to write it up. And they'll say, yeah, we don't have time to figure it out or verify it or know what's going on. So we'll just say the, the clip appears to show right, that uh, the Bush Quail campaign is spending money outside the United States. Then they'll investigate. The Bush Quail campaign will respond. And then the article saying, well, actually, it had nothing to do with the campaign, will come out and get approximately two Facebook shares. And everyone will be, tens of thousands of people will be sure the Bush Quail campaign spent all this money in South America. So that's the challenge of today's journalistic environment, which is that everything is instant and immediate. There isn't time to check things in the same way there used to be. There aren't those sorts of guardrails, which means you have to be a lot faster and a lot quicker to be able to do those things. And many people just don't bother. Right? Or they do, but they're, you know, they have such a small window. Right, and they have very little margin for error. So it's, and that's a huge challenge, and I'm not here to tell you a solution, but I think that that's a really big problem that the journalist profession is facing right now. So you mentioned um, what's going on in Europe, and you mentioned the, the term the far left. How does the two questions related to the political environment that journalists face, one directly related to our topic tonight about attacks on journalists, um, do the politics of the journalist have an impact on what type of hate and, uh, and w the level of anti-Semitic attacks that they'll receive? And also, just while we're there, why don't we, I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, what's going on far left, far right, and how, that's, how, how the media is reporting on those things. Yeah, so I, in general, Journalists that write about Jewish issues and have very Jewish names and public profiles will get more of this stuff than those who don't. Um, that's one of the reasons why this was happening for years, but it wasn't really talked about or reported about. Uh, but then comes along the 2016 presidential campaign, um, and suddenly it gets talked about. Because what was happening? Originally, it was just you know people with names like Jeffrey Goldberg or Yair Rosenberg who write about Israel and Jew stuff as part of their briefs who were getting this stuff. And it was just sort of a known part of the game, and it didn't get really that much attention. But then the election campaign comes around. And a significant number of people on social media who identify themselves as the alt-right coalesce around Donald Trump's candidacy for various reasons. And they start attacking Jewish journalists who write things they don't like. And so then lots of journalists who otherwise didn't receive this stuff, they might have been Jewish, but they were writing about you know, Washington politics and national stuff. Right? And so there was, in the past, they never really received much of this anti-Semitic vitriol. But suddenly they're writing, because they didn't write about things that interested the anti-Semites. But now they're writing about Donald Trump, and that interests a lot of anti-Semites. So they start getting all this abuse that they weren't getting before. Many of them are very shocked to receive it because they're not used to it. And they start talking about it on social media, on Twitter, this platform that didn't exist you know, 10, 15 years ago in the same way. Um, and so suddenly everyone's seeing and hearing about it, and so it becomes a big story. Um, so yes, it depends what you write about. You'll get it more and less. If you write about things that interest anti-Semites, you'll get it more. In terms of far left, far right, um, you know, before the election campaign. I used to get this stuff in equal measure from the far left and the far right. Um, the far right typically tends to hate Jews outside Israel more. The far left tends to hate Jews inside Israel more, and anyone who likes the Jews inside Israel. In practice, though, it's very hard. Once you start hating half the Jews in the world, it invariably leaks over in weird ways, right, to the other half of the Jews in the world. Because all Jews are connected, we support each other, we have relatives, and so on, and we're not going to denounce the other kinds of Jews. And so once you attack one half, whether it's the half in Israel or the half outside of Israel, which you wish was in Israel, right, you'll end up in a, in a dark place. Um, so that, and you know, what I do tell people, an important thing about far left, far right, is that a lot of times when I talk about anti-Semitism to audiences, somebody will say to me, well, the real problem you know is you know, on the college campuses, the left-wing radicals. And then somebody else will say, well, the real problem, as you know, is actually the alt-right and all of these horrible right-wing people who are you know, coalesced into you know, this radical group in the Republican politics today. And what I say to people is it really doesn't matter. The only people who win the argument over is there more anti-Semitism on the right or left are the anti-Semites who keep being anti-Semites while we sit here fighting about who's actually more anti-Semitic. That is really is just a form of misdirection. And moreover, if you're a, you know, a liberal going over and telling a bunch of conservatives that you guys really need to work on this alt-right problem and this anti-Semitism problem isn't going to have the effect you want. 
at the best, they'll laugh you off. At worst, they'll circle the wagons and get defensive and start defending the stuff that they wouldn't have defended before. And the same thing is true if a conservative, if a liberal went over and told a bunch of conservatives, or a conservative went over and told a bunch of liberals. You have to fight anti-Semitism in your own community. If you're left-wing, then you fight it among left-wing people. If you're right-wing, among right-wing people, because that's where you have credibility, and that's where you have connections and colleagues and friends. That's also where it's much more uncomfortable. It's so much easier to point at somebody else far outside yourself and say, that's a problem. It's much harder to point at people who are nearby and try to educate them and do this in a responsible way. But that's actually the only place where you probably will have any chance of changing it. So one of the things that ADL does and has done for decades is track two metrics related to anti-Semitism. One is we do an annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents. Episodes are things that we read or hear about or get reported to our office and that we deal with. And then we do this all over the country. And the other is we track anti-Semitic attitudes, meaning we do surveys and polling of people to figure out, and we ask them a series of questions, and we try to get a sense of how much anti-Semitism there is in America. We also do it in Europe and around the world, but um, I've been getting a lot of questions in the last six, eight months about is anti-Semitism getting worse? Is there more anti-Semitism? Do you know ADL must be really busy because anti-Semitism is getting so much worse? Um, and I just want to share with you the what we've seen in our studies. With respect to the incidents, there has been a significant spike and rise in the number of anti-Semitic incidents, both here in Connecticut and around the country. And those uh, you know, take not, not, not forms that we're not used to. I mean, we're, a lot of it is graffiti incidents, assaults, threats, um, stuff in schools with kids, stuff in schools with kids. There was a uh, some terrible threats online from a guy in Stanford last year, which you may have heard about, which we can talk about later. Um, the incidence numbers are far, far worse than they were a year ago, and they continue. Um, and Andy Friedland from my office um, has the not so uh, great pleasure of taking those calls and, and helping us develop those solutions. And we really do try to get get into those communities and make those problems better. Um, the other side is the attitudes. And what I can tell you is we did release a study a couple months ago of our survey. And for the last 10 or 15 years, the number that, that we've come up with about Americans, the percentage of Americans who hold strong anti-Semitic beliefs has been in the 12 to 15 percent range. Okay? And we just released the numbers, and it's about 14 percent. And so I'll get to my question in one second, but I just want to point out that people say, oh, so maybe the anti-Semitism isn't worse. And I would actually disagree with that. The number of incidents is an indication that, you know, when you have 14% of America and there's 350 Amer million Americans, that's still a lot of people with very strong anti-Semitic views, and they can cause a lot of damage assuming they're the ones doing those incidents. And, when, and once that ball gets going, it's hard to stop it from rolling down that hill. So with respect to the media and your role, how do you see your role with respect to covering these incidents? How do we pay the appropriate amount of attention without over-dramatizing and creating a copycat situation? How do you, how do you um, approach reporting on incidents, or how do your colleagues report it? So how do we approach? How, you know? How do, you, how, do you, how do you see your role and the media's role when there's an anti-Semitic incident mm -hmm. um, that either is a local one or grabs national attention? Oh, that's a good question. I think some of it has to do with uh, deciding what is significant and what is less so. Uh, because the truth is not, every, not all anti-Semitic incidents are created equal. And a lot of what the media's job in general is we curate information and decide. This is important to talk about, this is not. Um, a lot of times people talk about media bias in terms of ideological inflections of things that are reported. But media bias, I think, in general, and it can be you know, whether you like the bias or not, is actually in what people decide to report on and where they actually, what they actually decide to elevate into an issue versus what they decide not to talk about. Um, and often, though, that judgment, and that's, that's the really the real powerful judgment of the media. 
Um, and I think a lot of times uh, they do a good job. Uh, for example, right now there's an anti-Semitic candidate running for city council in New York. He does this every few years, and he runs against greedy Jewish landlords. It's very straightforward. It's extremely anti-Semitic, and he runs every few years. And I get some inquiries, you know, you know, every few days, why aren't you guys talking about or running about this guy? And here's the reason. Nobody ever votes for him. He does this every few years. It's largely a play for attention. He's obviously very trouble. Right? And it doesn't represent anything. No, he's never been a force in, in New York politics. He's never been elected. And he will never be elected. If he was suddenly like, getting lots of donations and getting like, real venues wanted to host him and all of that, fine. But he's a guy with a Twitter account right, who puts up some signs you know, where he lives. Uh, and so someone like that is actually asking for attention. They're not newsworthy, and they don't deserve it. Um, on the other hand, sometimes there are things that uh, get overlooked uh, that are significant and that are deserving of people explaining you know, this is not acceptable or okay. So some of you may have heard about this uh, March far left um, LGBT event in Chicago called the Chicago Dyke March. That's what they call themselves. Um, and they were marching in Chicago and there were some Jews there who were waving Jewish pride flags. Uh, Jewish pride flags are rainbow flags with the Star of David superimposed over them. They date back, you know, some 40 years. And uh, they are Jewish flags. They are not Israeli flags. Someone who is ignorant of the history of the Star of David might think that they were somehow related to Israel. Um, but otherwise, anyone who knows anything about Judaism knows, of course, the Star of David far predates the state of Israel. But these people waving Jewish pride flags were kicked out, told that their flags were triggering because they were Zionist. And they explained, well, no, this is just a symbol of my Jewish identity. Jewish pride marchers all over the world wave these flags. You have no idea what my opinions are on Israel. And regardless, it's not relevant here. Uh, it didn't matter. They kicked these people out. So something like that is definitely worth talking about. Can, yeah. can, can we, I just want to re repeat that quickly so that everybody can understand. So there was a, a march in Chicago right before the gay pride parade called it the Dyke March. And three, in, three women were carrying flags with rainbows on them and a Jewish star. And the organizers of the march, and it's a very loosely run organization, asked them to leave because the mere presence of that symbol was making other people who are part of that march uncomfortable because those people were, are, um, are anti-Israel, see Israel as the oppressor, and it was making them feel uncomfortable. So I just want to pause and say that, that um, I think we all need to think about that. That is, a, um, that is a very uh, troubling moment um, for um, Jews who want to support the LGBT community to not, and, and our Jews who are part of the LGBT community to not be welcome is a very troubling thing. And I, I want to use that to, to pivot, if I can, to talk about the situation, and we are spending a lot of time on the progressive left anti-Semitism. Um, but I want to I want to go a little bit further with this. Um, there are people who are leaders in the progressive left who believe that it is that um, Israel is the oppressor and there should not be a Jewish state of Israel. They don't believe in a two-state solution. They believe in boycotting Israel, um, and you've written a lot about it. And so I'd like to get your thoughts today. You actually wrote a very uh, powerful article about a, a leading figure in this area, and maybe you can share with us uh, what you're thinking. Yeah, so as Steve alluded to, a lot of anti-Semitism on the far left tends to coalesce around Israel. Um, and then there's absolutely nothing anti-Semitic about criticizing Israel, um, including in extremely vituperative terms. Um, and I actually have a very high bandwidth for that stuff. Um, I write in that field. I have criticized Israel intensely. I would not disallow somebody from doing the exact same thing, uh, whether from the left or from the right. Um, and so that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something far, far more beyond that where people start saying things that are demonstrably untrue, that echo age-old anti-Semitic myths simply applied to the Jewish state. Um, for example, the notion that, say, Israel is committing Palestinian genocide. There is a Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics that they run. They record a fourfold increase um, in the Palestinian population since the advent of the State of Israel. So that's just a blood libel on a national scale. That's taking something that people said about Jews before, right? that they killed Gentiles um, wantonly, and taking it and maximizing it and multiplying it by a Jewish state. Uh, so things like that. 
Um, and so, yeah, so I, I happened, and so, and that's the sort of thing that is difficult to talk about because you want to be careful not to ensnare legitimate criticism of Israel that sometimes might be expressed in an uncouth or angry way, and criticism of Israel that goes far beyond that. Um, and part of what I do is try to disentangle that and explain it in a calm and rational way to people so we can sort of build a consensus around what's okay and what's not. Um, and uh, so the, the article that uh, Steve alluded to that I wrote, uh, actually, that was published this morning, is about a particular uh, Palestinian-American uh, civil, you know, progressive and civil rights activist named Linda Sarsour, uh, who works out of New York. Um, and she's done wonderful things for civil rights and certain civil liberties issues. Um, and, you know, she has a lot of, you know, wonderful allies, you know, within the progressive community for that work that she's done. Um, but she also has certain various views about, say, Israel and Jews that can be very troubling, not particularly, you know, some of them, one might say is disturbing, some are just, you know, very strong views that, you know, people are entitled to hold. Um, for example, she supports the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement Against Israel, which seeks to uh, silence and uh, bar, you know, Israeli artists, academics, uh, politicians, and generally people who think that Israel has a right to exist from speaking in public forums, from, you know, being at universities, being published, uh, they're artists from performing in different places, and Linda Sarsour supports this, and not against any other country. Uh, so that sort of thing, that sort of singling out Israel for an extreme reaction and basically silencing all the voices of those who support Israel's right to exist in whatever borders. Um, so that's very troubling, and so I, I have written some things about that, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily go to, you know, I don't always say, like, I don't know if that's anti-Semitic. It depends on the person and what are their motivations. But I can say, is that logical? Is that rational? Is that fair? Right? And that conversation I can have with someone, no matter whether they think it's anti-Semitic or not. I think most people, if you started talking that way about any other country and saying, we're going to make all Iranians anathema, we would say that's, that's a little creepy and overreacting to things that are going on, right? even if you strongly disagree with the actions of a government. And so sometimes I would say that it's valuable to have this conversation on the ground of fairness and rationality rather than like bringing in anti-Semitism into the conversation, which can be a harder conversation to have. Great. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll get to yours. What do you think the role of organizations like the ADL should be within the media using our voice? What is the role we should play? So one of the reasons I like the ADL, um, as someone who reports on a lot of the same things that the ADL deals with, is that um, they're one of the few Jewish organizations that really, when they do talk about anti-Semitism, talk about it across the spectrum, from the left to the right. Now, as a curmudgeonly journalist, do I always agree with every position they take on every single person and issue? No. But they work really hard, and they have a lot of really smart people who spend their days studying this stuff and working on it. And they don't sit around using anti-Semitism as a cudgel to support one political party over the other, one cause over the other. They simply care about the issue. Um, and as a result, we can sit here and talk about far-left anti-Semitism or far-right anti-Semitism. There are certain Jewish organizations where if I go there and talk about far-right anti-Semitism, they'll get uncomfortable, right? Because they're a very conservative organization and this is people that they don't really want to talk about. They're much more comfortable talking about the left. Um, and the same thing is true on certain left-wing Jewish spaces that I would go into, where they're not so comfortable with talking about left-wing anti-Semitism. Um, the ADL creates space to talk about all of those things, and sometimes they take fire from both sides because they call out both sides. Um, and so the role of any, I think, good organization that cares about any form of bigotry, whether it's anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, or any form of racism, is not to be afraid to point it out when you just call it as you see it. Um, and not try to pretend that it's worse in one place or another, or try to play that game. Because as I said before, if you play that game, you've already lost. Um, and so that's the sort of role that I think any good watchdog organization should, should play. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I like going to an ADL event, because I feel like I can be my whole self and talk about all the forms and all the things that I see and deal with. And that's why we like having him at our events. So Andy's going to share with us some... I, I, um, I'm not sure how well people can see. But. Yeah, so do you want to walk through that? Well, I'm not sure how well. I'm not sure how well people can see, but uh, Andy is cycling through some of the stuff that ADL corrected of uh, the sort of harassment that was sent uh, towards Jewish journalists during the election campaign. You see Jewish journalists photoshopped into Holocaust uh, imagery, you know, gas chambers, uh, various other, you know, garish scenes. Um, and so, like, you have these sorts of things. You'll see. Uh, you can sort of see on the edge over here, these, this one was actually, I think, directed at me. 
uh, those three parentheses around Rosenberg. You see the beginning of Rosenberg. So there was a particular term of harassment that was set up uh, on Twitter and elsewhere on the internet by the alt-right, which was if a Jew writes something, a Jewish journalist writes something you dislike or disagree with, uh, instead of saying, I disagree with you because of X, like a normal person, you just say, well, of course, that's what Rosenberg would say. And you put Rosenberg in triple parentheses. And the idea was, this person's Jewish, don't trust them, just attack them for being Jewish. And again, if you're not used to this, this can be very creepy if you're a journalist, because that's not a normal response to something you do. Um, and so and one of the things that I did with some others is we got a lot, a lot of people, thousands of people, in fact, on social media to take parentheses and put them around their names, Jews and non-Jews, so that anti-Semites can no longer harass people by putting these around their name because suddenly everybody had them. Uh, and if you go onto Twitter now, you'll still see plenty of people with these parentheses. And if you're wondering, what is that? Right, that's where it came from. It was a lot of people basically saying, we're going to put on that yellow star right, so that it becomes a useless symbol as an identification and oppression, and it becomes a reclamation. Yeah, so as you can see, there are some like various an classic anti-Semitic cartoons, you know, you know anti-Semitic imagery. Someone up there, Jonathan Weissman, is uh, one of the Washington editors of the New York Times who got a lot of this material during the 2016 election. Yeah, this, that was an attack on Julia Yaffe, a particular journalist who wrote a profile of Melania Trump, which was viewed as critical by a lot of Trump supporters. And as a result, anti-Semites attacked Julia Yaffe. They sent threatening phone calls to her house. Someone even called an undertaker. As, uh, an, on, be, on her behalf so that they would leave a message on her machine, things like that. Um, so some of the tweets you're seeing are directed at her or about her. This is, you know, Israel did 9-11, the logo. Some of these are really fun. I actually, I have my personal favorite anti-Semitic memes. There's like a, a, an anti-Semitic Toy Story meme that's called Guy Story. And it's like uh, they turn like Woody into a stereotypical hook-nosed Jew and Buzz into a black man because they hate minorities, Jews, and African Americans, so they're teaming up to destroy Western civilization. Um, yep, these are some more. Exactly. That's a, some of these are very classic. The, the scheming Jew with the hook nose is, a, is one of the most uh, trafficked anti-Semitic memes online. So now you have a sense. And on that happy note, we'll take, yeah, so, we'll take so, questions. OK. So. so um, We'd love to, um, so thank you, Yair, for that taking, thank you for taking my questions. Um, and now let's, uh, um, I guess um, we can go around the room. Uh, anybody have a question off the bat? Uh, go ahead in, in the back. You have a word. Yeah, so the question was, do I think uh, that first, uh, left-wing anti-Semitism in Britain, which is something that I brought up, is it worse um, in some way than left-wing anti-Semitism, say, in America? Um, and so I wouldn't say, it's always hard to make these sorts of comparisons from country to country. Um, I just certainly think it's more acute in Europe. I think the danger is that American discourse could turn that way, both on the left and the right. Um, you know, in America, you have, as I said, people are doing this largely anonymously. They're largely afraid to put their names to some of this material. Um, whereas in the UK, certainly on the far left, people are starting to put their names to this stuff. Um, I don't know if it's mainstream in the UK, this is a very loaded word, but it's certainly present and it's certainly done openly. Um, and openly is, I think, the key. Um, and so I would say at this point, yes, it's more acute in, uh, in Europe, which I don't think should surprise because historically Europe has a much more unfortunate history with anti-Semitism and there are a lot of structures and assumptions and cultural ideas built in uh, in Europe about Jews that simply don't exist in America, uh, where we deal more acutely, I think, with other forms of racism first and anti-Semitism later. If the individual that's in the White House right now had decided not to run, if he was just still doing what he did beforehand, would there be, in your opinion, <coughs> the rise in anti-Semitic activity that's going on right now anyway? Is all of this just part of you know, what's happening worldwide, or is this, in, is this particular individual, did he really stoke it, like lighting a match? They're asking me a classic historical question, which is, is, are historical forces what drives everything, or are there great men and people who actually affect and change directions, or are they all just expressions of historical forces? I mean, if I could solve that, um, you know. But, uh, you know, so I, I don't know. Um, it's hard to speculate. 
Um, I certainly think that, you know, Steve related that the same number of people hold anti-Semitic attitudes, right, per ADL's most recent polling as did before the election, but you're seeing an increase in, say, violent incidents, in particular expressions of that anti-Semitic sentiment. So I do think we have seen some people feeling empowered to act out on those sentiments since the election in a way they didn't before. That's what I would say. Um, and I do think it is connected in some way to the election. Uh, but in a certain sense, you know, that, that's as far as I'm willing to go. I don't think for it's created more anti-Semites. It may have emboldened people. And I think that like, authority figures set examples for parameters of acceptable discourse. Um, and you know, certainly the parameters of American discourse politically, ideologically, have been massively widened. And that's created a lot of space for a lot of extreme views to come out a little more. I, I, I would take the same position um, that Yair advocated. I, I think that the, the erosion of civility that we started, that we started to see that years ago, um, how kids talk to each other, how people talk to each other in comment sections of, of papers and blogs, et cetera. Um, we started to see that a long time ago, um, way before um, President Trump decided to run for office. However, there were certain moments in his campaign that definitely you would see a huge spike, particularly among the what are called the, the, the our alt right groups, you know, cheering him on as he would say things. And I think that that has led them to um, have more confidence to express their views. And sometimes those turn into incidents of hate. Um, so, but I I think that it's not that he won and became the president. It was. It was a tough election, and it was a tough campaign, but the seeds of the lack of kindness and the breadth of what's acceptable now in, in, in politics and how people talk to each other, is, uh, it's, uh, it's eroded. Uh, and so that's, I think that's made it easier. And, uh, the question was, did, uh, is anti-Semitism something that we're just seeing more because of social media, or is social media sort of creating it? Um, I think first and foremost, it, it, again, and social media just show, it gives a megaphone to us, right, in a whole variety of ways. It puts a magnifying glass over smaller populations that you might not have heard before, but we're always there. Uh, so I think it's actually very revelatory. And that's one of the thing, reasons I sort of like looking at social media. It's not an accurate reflection sometimes of reality, because certain like extreme voices tend to be louder, for example. And you have to discount things because of that. But what it does do is it can magnify things that we weren't seeing, sometimes bad things, sometimes things that we ought to be noticing but wouldn't before, like people have been victimized or otherwise weren't heard and should have been heard. And social media and the internet has given them a way to organize and express themselves. Uh, so you know, it's not just the racists who can use social media. It's also the good guys. Um, and in a certain sense, the challenge of today is not, you know, social media is not going back in the box. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, it's, you know, so the, it's not really the problem isn't the technology, the problem is the people. And if you train better people and to use technology responsible, as has always been the challenge, right, then the technology will be a good one, right? And if people are not trained that way, then they will use it in a bad and caustic and destructive way. Um, and so that's really, to me, the real question and some of what I do with this dealing with bigotry with humor, raising awareness, mobilizing people to act against it. Right, is a way of like, creating a better community, a community that's more immune to this stuff and that polices itself and that uses technology in a healthy way. So I, I'd like to share just a little good news. Um, we've heard a lot, of, a lot about incidents. Um, one of the things that we've seen at our office in this, as this spike in incidents has happened has, has been a really encouraging sense of the response from individuals, community members, um, interfaith groups, political leaders, and how different people are responding to these incidents. Um, not in every case, but there are, you know, even a couple years ago, incidents that may have not gotten reported or confronted are being reported and confronted. Um, and, lo and just within Connecticut, um, last week there, have been a, there were a couple incidents, and the, the way that the police and the first selectman or mayor in these towns like took the mantle and said, this is not what we stand for. The situations of community members seeing a bad situation either on social media or in their public park and turning that graffiti symbol into something beautiful. There, there are countless examples of communities sort of rising to support. And this is crossing 
political lines. It has very little to, you know, it's really been um, encouraging for us to see the response, to see how many people, when these incidents happen, they call and they say, hey, will you, ADL, will you come talk with our town? Will you come teach us how to be closer with each other and respect each other? It's been, um, it's been a really um, a, a benefit and a, by, a nice byproduct of uh, what is otherwise something negative. Um, so next question. So the very small question was, what is happening to journalism now? Um, which I will answer within 30 seconds, because I talk very fast. Um, so, I mean, I talked a little bit about some of the ways I perceive it, right? The immediacy, the instantaneous nature of reporting leading to a lack of, you know, buffer time and margin for error for journalists that they might have possessed before. Um, I think that's, you know, something that the profession is dealing with, you know, being responsible. Because when you make mistakes, right, people do notice them and it discredits those institutions. And I don't think, you know, a certain amount of, like, erosion of trust in the media and anger towards the media and the society is due to forces that are riling up people against the media. But it's also due to the fact that journalists make a lot of mistakes. And because of the rise of the internet and other sources of information, people are starting to see that. It used to be there were certain networks and they had a monopoly on the information you saw. And hopefully they use that responsibly to check everything they put out there and do a good job. And I'd like to think they did. In a certain sense, they did because they were able to wait on things and do all that. Today, they can't. Uh, but also, they're all, now that there isn't that monopoly, people can all poke holes in all of the coverage. So we see all of the flaws today that we might not have seen before, and that naturally erodes trust. But again, that's a genie you can't put back in the bottle. What you need to do is have better journalists, and journalists who are you know, twice as good as they used to be, uh, to be able to do the job well and to retain the trust of their readers. And the thing is, there are people who still have trust. Um, and there is this sense like, well, the media has lost trust. I think individual journalists, particular people, have cultivated a relationship of trust with various viewers and readers over the years because they consistently are reliable and say things that turn out to be true and they explain things well in the world. Um, and you can do that in a very, if you, it's a painstaking and long process. I try to do that with my readers. Um, you know, someone like CNN's Jake Tapper tries to do that very hard with his readers. He doesn't just report, he's on social media, and he listens to what different groups of people are talking about, liberals and conservatives, things they think are not getting attention, and then he'll look into those, and if he thinks they're worth it, he'll then talk about them, and you can see it, how it moves from people talking about it to him making it into a story, and they see, oh, this person really pays attention and is listening. Um, do I think journalists are particularly under threat in physical danger? I don't. Um, you know, it, all it takes is one lone nut with a gun, you know, and that's the unfortunate thing. Uh, but I don't think we are particularly, you know, people criticize us. That's a thing, you know, but it comes with the territory. Um, and sort of, and it always was there. Um, and the fact that, you know, Donald Trump tweets an animated meme of a wrestler beating up CNN, it's juvenile, it's childish, it's pathetic, it's unbecoming of the leader of the three world, if I can be political for a second. But it's not dangerous in that way. It's dangerous to America's credibility in the world because people see that we have a toddler, you know, level of whatever in the Oval Office, right? But that's not dangerous to me as a journalist per se. It's dangerous to me as an American, I think. What, what I guess you should have said, what about the charge You're saying, what about the charge of fake news? I don't think that that's, I think he's there, that's an example of somebody just vocalizing something that was already a sentiment that many people already shared. Right? Lots of people felt that news outlets were not presenting full or fair pictures of a lot of things. And that's not exclusive to the right wing. There are plenty of people on the left who also felt that media outlets were not adequate to the task. Um, and so Trump is very good at putting his finger. And here's the thing, here's the important thing. The term fake news was not invented by Donald Trump. The term fake news, if you follow the genesis of this, came out after the uh, 2016 election when media outlets said that part of the reason Trump won was that there was all this misinformation reported out there by like ideological partisans who presented it as real news on fake websites that misled people into voting for Donald Trump. And so the media coined this term fake news to describe something that they thought was bad and pernicious in the environment. And Trump immediately repurposed it and said, no, you're fake news. And the fact that that works so well suggests that maybe the media doesn't really have as good of trust relationship with the people they were talking to, because it would never have been repurposed so easily if not for the fact that there, more people felt that the media was failing, right? Then you know, and so the trust wasn't there in the first place, um, and that's how you know Trump is a symptom, not the cause. So the question was, um, 
not just let's talk about problems, but solutions. What should individuals do when confronted with anti-Semitism in their own personal daily experience online or in person? Um, and I think what I say to people, the most important thing you can do is actually just take, first of all, don't assume the person is, is evil, right? And certainly don't assume that everyone who believes that particular thing is evil. Keep in mind that there are, American Jews are 2% of the population. The vast majority of Americans and the vast majority of the world has never met a Jew. They know nothing about Jews. Um, and therefore, they can believe a lot of weird and unusual cultural stereotypes about Jews as they do about many other people. And it's not because they're bad people. We all have those things about lots of groups we don't have enough familiarity with. And so what I try to do as a journalist is not write things and just say, oh, this is really anti-Semitic and assume you know what I mean. I will then try to explain in plain language that's understandable and accessible to a large number of people and isn't histrionic why this is hateful, misleading, un, you know, ignorant, so on and so forth. Uh, but mm -hmm. also why it's believed, why people might have this misconception, right? And if you just take the time and patience and don't just fly off the handle or shut down, but actually try to engage, you'll find that a lot of people actually say, oh, that really helped, that explains something to me. Um, and, and it's a natural impulse by any minority group that when they're confronted with racism to not want to explain themselves, but say, you should know better. And it's true, ideally, everyone should know better, but the truth is all of us don't know better because we don't have that experience with every single group and every single community we come in contact with. And so people can say, if you see anti-Semitism and you come across it, if it's in person or if it's online, you can say, well, I just saw this thing and I thought it would be valuable to share it on Facebook and lots of your non-Jewish friends will see it, right? This is a hateful thing people say about Jews. I thought I would take a little bit of time to explain why, because not everyone realizes what's going on here. And then you just take a couple paragraphs and just explain And you'd be amazed at how valuable that can be. Sharing anti-Semitism on Twitter has like, you know, created a connection between me and like, friends who are Muslim journalists who said, you know, before I started following you on Twitter, I didn't realize you guys, you Jewish journalists, get the exact same stuff we Muslim journalists get. Right? We want to you know, impose ourselves on the world, and we're all these crazy extremists, and we mess everything up we touch, and we're all evil, and we all think the same way. Right? All of the same material, but they didn't know, and it's not because they were bad people. It's because there aren't a lot of Jews, and it wasn't coming at them. And so it's important that uh, if you want to deal with this yourself, you take the time to explain it to people who might not otherwise know. We have time for one, one more question. question. Make it a good one. <laughs> the question was, there was multiple questions. One of the questions was, it's OK. You got one question, the last question. You pack it all in. Uh, the first question was, what do you do about other Jews who call you anti-Semitic? Uh, I think the particular question was coming from the right, but the truth is this comes in all directions. Um, and then the other question was, you know, how do you deal with uh, Israel, which has foreign relations sometimes with countries that seem to have less than stellar records on anti-Semitism, in particular in the example of Hungary. Uh, these are great questions, uh, some of which I've written a little bit about, some of which I haven't. Um, in general, Jews like to call each other anti-Semites a little far too much. Um, it's something we should stop doing. Um, and I, I, you know, and it's really not a helpful thing, and it really is really a hurtful charge to throw at people. It's totally fine to disagree in really strong vitriolic terms and try to explain why you're right and why the other person is wrong. Using a word like that isn't productive. It's not going to convince anybody, right? It's mostly performative, emotive anger, right? So when left wing, I've seen left wing Jews call right wing settlers and people who support right wing governments in Israel the real anti Semites. And I've seen the exact opposite all the time from the you know, people who support the Israeli right. And the left-wing Jews, they're all traitors, and they're the real anti-Semites. Right? None of these people are the anti-Semites. Right? I deal with the real anti-Semites. And so it's really, and so as a general principle, you know, it is important to try, and that's a general Jewish communal thing that we need to work on, is teaching Jews who have very strong and very different political views um, to talk to each other and understand where they're coming from, even if they're ultimately going to disagree very strongly. Right? Soros Jews and Adelson Jews. Teach them to you know, understand and somewhat respect each other, even if they're ultimately going to strongly disagree. And that's a totally different lecture that I can give another time. Um, then the question of how do you, you know, it's a very, so how do you deal with Israel having foreign relations with a country, say Hungary, and others that have less than stellar records when it comes to discussing their anti-Semitic past or present? Um, this is a really difficult question because, uh, for example, Israel took reparations from Germany uh, right after the Holocaust when it, Germany hadn't even reconstructed yet, right? In a certain sense, Israel was like taking blood money and, you know, building their state with money coming from a country that literally had just, you know, led the extermination of millions of Jews. And lots of those people were still running free and had been involved, and if you look at the history of this sort of stuff. Um, and there was a huge debate in Israel over whether to take that money. 
and ultimately Israel did. And this is one of those sorts of difficult choices when you're a small country, not just a person, right? And you have a whole society, and you know, and you really need to like take geopolitical considerations into account, and also moral considerations. And it's really, really difficult. And so obviously Netanyahu will say, I see myself in that tradition of making those sorts of balances. And I'll still say to you about Hungary, for example, that he got the Hungarian uh, Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, to get up there at their press conference and say, you know, it was a sin, that was the word he used, that Hungary collaborated during the Holocaust with the Nazis which is something that the right wing in Hungary does not want to admit happened and has worked very hard to efface. And, and Netanyahu extracted that publicly from him. Meanwhile, the far right and the far left in France, Marine Le Pen and his far left and her, her far left counterpart, uh, both of whom lost to Macron, have both come out and said that the Vichy France, right, the France in general was not uh, complicit in the you know, murder of Jews in the Holocaust, right? And so, like that's been that's going on, you know, over there. And so like Netanyahu actually went to Hungary and he, you know, tried to like toe a line and like not tick them off too much. And then he got the prime minister to say something that a lot of politicians in Europe are not willing to say. Um, so it's hard, right? Would I have done what Netanyahu did? No, right? That's not my personal thing. Uh, this is my effort to try to show how we can look at other people and not say you're the anti-Semites, but sort of like can we put ourselves in the shoes and say what are the difficult considerations and questions they're dealing with and trying to figure it out. And then we could say, I still strongly disagree, but I understand. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for great questions. Great questions. Thank you very much. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.